We live in a world of signs, don't we? There are signs everywhere you turn. And uh, as we grow up, we learn to read signs. We, need, we learn to acknowledge and to recognize, and they become intuitively part of our daily life. Uh, I assume that uh, some of these signs I want to put up are signs that you'll recognize. Uh, check this next sign out. Tell me what this sign means. Stop. Stop. Yeah, that's very good. Excellent. That was an easy one. Uh, next one. Oh, all right. Very, very good. Next one. Oh, you, you, you are good. Yes. Hospital, emergency services. Uh, one more. Warning. Very good. Alert or, or warning. Watch out. Something is coming ahead. When, uh, by the way, my, my wife, uh, Lori, and I celebrated our 31st uh, wedding anniversary this past Thursday. I think that's for you, not so much for me. Uh, but uh, we, we celebrated our, our 31 year anniversary. On our anniversary, we had the opportunity to go to Cancun, Mexico. And uh, that, was, that was a lot of fun. And when we went, uh, we didn't have a lot of money. We just married, had a chance to get down there. And, uh, and one of the, the places that was down there that was really big at that time was a place called Club Med. Everybody wanted to go to Club Med, stay at Club Med, you know, hit the Club Med beaches and pools, etc. That was big uh, back then. And so I remember getting down there. We weren't staying at Club Med. And, and yet, we wanted to go in, but there was a gate, and you had to pay a fee to even go in for day use, and it was a high fee. So, so we did something that I have since confessed for, okay, just so that you know. And uh, we went around to the far end of the property where the fence and the wall ended, and we walked around that to sneak in. We went to the beach area, and the beach area, at, right at the border of Club Med, had this long pier. And the pier had barbed wire on it so that you couldn't kind of go through the pier. So we, yes, this is true, we, uh, mostly me and dragging my new bride with me, uh, went out into the ocean, swam around the pier <laughs> so that we could sneak into Club Med. We got to the beach area, and at the beach area, there was nobody there. We're like, we had the whole place to ourselves. We could hear off in the distance people playing and, and swimming and laughing by the pool. But at the beach, there was nobody there. And we're thinking, we have the whole beach to ourselves here in Club Med. This is awesome. I know how to pick them, hun. That's what I thought in my mind. And, and so we put our stuff down by the sign that was there, and we went into the water. And we're just having fun in the water. We're waist deep and then chest deep. And, and then we're at about five, five feet of water. And, and all of a sudden, we feel ourselves being pulled back, being pulled out into the ocean. And, and so we try to kind of come back, and, and yet we're pulled back again. And now we're in about five and a half feet of water. And so uh, my new bride is kind of bouncing up a little bit to, to breathe there, having to tread water. And... Uh, and so we're saying, yeah, let's go in a little bit further. Let's, let's uh, be safer. And as we try to go in and swim in, all of a sudden, this strong current begins to pull us back out into the ocean. Now, as that happens, we begin to swim harder. And, and as my new wife begins to, to swim towards the front, uh, towards the beach, uh, she gets sucked under. And uh, she disappears. I look around, and all of a sudden, she comes up sputtering water, saying, something pulled me down and uh, dragged me across the bottom. And I could see sand on her face, dragged me across the bottom uh, there of where we were, and again, about five or six feet of water. And I said, uh-oh, so we better, we better go in. And again, we swim harder, but the harder we swim, the more that, uh, particularly her, she gets pulled in further and, and down and coming up sputtering. And... And we're figuring out, what are we going to do now? 
And uh, every time a wave came, we tried to swim with the wave, and we would seem to make some progress, almost to get back where we could touch, and then we'd get pulled back. And so I came up with a plan. I said, the next big wave that comes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to push you as hard as I can, and you're going to swim as hard as you can and hopefully be able to break free. And so we wait. The wave comes. I push. She goes, and I see her swimming, and as I push, of course, I get pushed back. And now I am seeing her as I'm treading water as she is waist deep and staggering now towards the beach, towards the sand on the beach. And I'm saying, excellent. She's safe. This is wonderful. Now she will be able to run and to get help for her new husband. Thank you for the one amen, one kind soul. Uh, and, and, and so she gets to the, the sand, and I see her. She just collapses, lays down on her face. And I'm thinking, well, she's resting for a moment. And I'm continuing to tread water and to try to swim forward. She's not moving. And I'm thinking, what am I going to do? And for the next about 10 uh, minutes, I, at least, I think, 10 or 15 minutes, as she's laying there, not moving, resting, uh, I, I'm swimming, trying to work my way back and, and, and get to where I can have a toe hold or something. And little by little, I can feel that I'm about in six feet of water, so I'm kind of jumping up because I'm not six feet tall and, and, and coming down. And again, a big wave comes. I swim as hard as I can. I'm, I'm running out of energy. And uh, all of a sudden, I'm able to get a toe hold and kind of force it down in there and, and able to take a step. And finally, I work my way slowly towards the beach to where my wife is laying down. And uh, I'm like, "Hun, I made it. She says to me, oh, I didn't even notice you weren't here. <laughs> like, excellent. We're off to a good start. And uh, she rolls over, and we both sit up on this sand, and we look at the sign that we had placed stuff by, and this is what it said. <laughs> Danger, no swimming allowed, strong current and undertow, stay back 100 feet. We were swimming in this water because we had not read the sign. No wonder the beach was empty, right? You know, I, I think about uh, this experience and I think about the question, what purpose do signs have? When you think about it, when we see a sign, what purpose does that sign have? You know, either informs us or, or directs us or warns us or prepares us or advertises something. And, uh, you know, those are oftentimes the signs that, that we see and intuitively understand. And we're used to it because we live in a world of signs. We live in a world where there's signs everywhere. And they can be in a variety of different way, uh, ways, those signs. They can have words. They can have numbers. They can have pictures. They can have icons. I mean, signs are everywhere that we look. There's even signs in human relationships, right? If you don't know that, then you're probably here by yourself, right? And if you don't understand that there's signs in human relationships. And men typically, men typically uh, are accused of not having the greatest skill at picking up signs, especially from women or wives. There's the amen. Thank you. <laughs> right? I mean, but there are signs everywhere. This morning, I want to uh, talk about a little bit about the signs of the second coming of Jesus, because oftentimes we talk about these signs, but we do so in a way that I think sometimes ends up being counterproductive or counter even intuitive to, to us. And it's important for us because as Seventh-day Adventist, the Seventh-day Adventist church is very a serious about the second coming of Jesus. So serious that we added it into our name. Second, se, uh, second coming, right? Seventh day Adventist. The Advent implies 
the second coming of Jesus, that we are to live in anticipation and look forward to the second coming of Jesus. For years, we've been talking, right, about the second coming of Jesus. And as we wait for the second advent, we have looked for signs. We have looked for Jesus' soon return. And as individuals, we have responded some different ways. And as a church, we've even responded uh, differently throughout history. So my question for us this morning, the question that I hope will come to a conclusion and have a, a conclusive answer for is, how should we respond to signs? specifically signs about the second coming because how we respond I believe communicates our view of God how we respond will communicate to others who then look upon us as Christ's followers how we see God and how they in turn will see God through us I'll give you an example there are some people who love, and, and we all should, to look for signs. And particularly as we look at what's happening in the world, we often then, our minds, if we're on a spiritual focus, that we, we, we see or we think that, hey, look what's happening around the world, and uh, what are we going to do? And one response, I guess I'll describe it this way, one, one response is like drinking Red Bull. Now, I've never drank Red Bull, but I've been around those who do. You know what Red Bull is, right? The drink, Red Bull. And, and what ends up happening uh, oftentimes is people respond in that way. I have a friend who is a Red Bull addict. He lives in another state, and when I visit him, I am amazed at the amount of Red Bull that he consumes. So much so that I often want to have an intervention. Say, man, we got to do something about this. And maybe you know somebody like that. But what ends up happening is I've noticed that people tend to react to the signs of the second coming in a similar way. They read something in the news. They see something that's going on in the world. And they have what I will refer to as a Red Bull moment. Ah! Right? All of a sudden, their attention is heightened. They're energized. Their spiritual life comes alive. Their eyes are, are wide open. Their bodies are twitching in anticipation. And they want to be ready. The problem is that the same thing happens spiritually as does physically when the caffeine wears off. They crash. And they're in worse shape than they were before. Have you known anybody that this has happened to they get so excited and then when that sign isn't what they thought it might be it wears off and they walk away so I think an important question for us is how we respond how is it that we can respond in a way that's healthy that God and that is God honoring that is uh, spiritually uh, healthy in a way that will help us to live what I like to refer to as an ever-ready life. See, the Adventist movement was born from a deep passion to see Jesus, right? The Adventist church, if you read its history, its deepest longing and what, what actually rooted that, uh, it was rooted from was this desire, this longing to see Jesus. And uh, out of that came the Adventist church to encounter Jesus, to see his face, to be home with him. And that's why it's part of our a church name. That's why it's part of our DNA. We long for Jesus to come. We sing about it. We talk about it. We want Jesus to come and put an, ev uh, an end to this evil and conflicted and divided planet and to usher in this kingdom of love and, and peace and, and joy, right? I mean, that's what we long for if we're part of the Adventist church. So what is the best way to live in readiness? as we await the second coming of Jesus. Because if we're honest, we've been saying that he's coming soon for a long time. There seems to be a delay, so how do we live with that? How do we deal with the tension that it might produce in us or our loved ones or those that we interact with when they tell us, you've been saying that 
for very long. How do we live in readiness? Uh, this, uh, this afternoon, I want to just spend a couple of moments. I want to share just a few thoughts on this. And if you want to fully, more fully explore this topic, uh, chapters 24 and 25 of the Gospel of Matthew is the place to start because there you will find the most extensive words that Jesus ever spoke about his second coming. But I want to just look at a couple of things, starting with verse 1 of chapter 24. Uh, and again, these two chapters are, are full. But I want to look at this and see what it might teach us when it comes to trying to live an ever-ready life in the, in, the, in the midst of a delay. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to him to show him the buildings of the temple. So this is the temple in Jerusalem. They've walked out. This is this magnificent structure. They walk out, and Jesus says to them in verse 2, he says, Hey, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon the other. There's not going to be one that's not going to be thrown down. Now, to the followers of Jesus' day, this sounded crazy. Has anybody here ever been to what's left of the wall, Wailing Wall of Jerusalem? They call the Wailing Wall. Anybody had an opportunity or you've seen it on pictures? I've had a chance to stand right, right beside it. Those stones are huge. The smallest of the stones that were used to build the temple were five tons in weight. Five tons. The smallest of, of those. And so they could not imagine what Jesus was saying. The stones are going to be thrown down. This magnificent temple, which was at, at the center of their faith and of their lives, this is going to be destroyed? No way. It's crazy. How can that ever happen? It was beyond their imagination. And that's why in verse 3, they asked the question that they ask. You know, Jesus is sitting there, and the disciples now come to him. He's made that common, and they're like, Jesus has lost his mind. And he says, tell us, when will this happen? But, you know, this, this destruction of the temple, these rocks, not even not being able to be one on top of the other, I mean, that's, that's crazy. What's going to be? That, that's got to be attached to the sign of the, your coming and the end of the age. See, they want to know what are the signs of the second coming. What are the signs of the end of the world? Because to them, in their minds, they couldn't fathom that those could be two separate events. And they were. And that's why oftentimes we get confused as we read these uh, verses here. They thought both were the same event. If Jerusalem was going to be destroyed, if the temple was going to be destroyed, then that had to be the end of the world. It had to be. I mean, they could not imagine anything else. They could not imagine. And we think that way too, right? I mean, if you're old enough to remember when John F. Kennedy was elected president, it was like a Catholic in the White House. It's the end of the world. <laughs> right? And we've done it since then, depending on the events, whether it's communism or Islam or whatever we want to uh, fill in the blank, whether it's a natural disaster, whether it's an earthquake, whether it's a certain pope that gets into gets uh, into office there, and of course, every pope, it seems like, that gets elected had a brother that was a Seventh-day Adventist, and it's just crazy. It's crazy, and yet we do that all the time. So Jesus says, look, <laughs> let me explain it to you, because you're not getting it. The destruction of the temple and the end of the world are not the same thing. When certain things happen that we think, oh, it must be the end of the world, they are not. And when we say that they are, we're actually discrediting Jesus' own words. We're doing a disservice to God's words by saying, it's the end, it's the end. And that's why Jesus goes on. And I want to look at a few verses, starting with verse 4. And, and see what he says. He says, look, let me explain it to you because I hope that you will understand. And Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. First thing is, it's going to be easy to be confused, to be deceived, because you're going to think that these two things go together, and it doesn't always, it's not going to work that way, in fact. It's not going to work that way at all. And then he begins to give illustrations of that in verse 
5, for many will come in my name. Many are going to say, hey, I'm Jesus, I'm the Christ, I'm the Messiah, I'm the deliverer. My way is the way. And so you'll be able to follow me. And then he says in verse 6, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Like this is new news. Well, it's not. So don't be troubled, he says. These things are going to pass and catch the last phrase. It's not the end. That's not the end when you hear wars and when things are disasters. The end is yet to come. Verse 7, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There's going to be famine and pestilences and earthquakes everywhere. And there's going to increase is actually what he's saying by putting those one after the other. It, it was a method of speaking that they saying those things are going to increase. And yet, hey, that's going to happen. And, and these, I love verse 8, these are the beginning. Key word, the beginning of birth pains. Other versions say sorrows, the beginning of difficult things. That's the beginning, not the end. And yet we often confuse it by saying that these, these must be signs of the end. Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. And then he goes on in verse 9. Then he will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. You're going to be hated by all nations and many will be offended. Verse 10 and betray one another and hate one another. There's going to be false prophets. Uh, there's going to be lawlessness that abounds. He kind of goes on and on. And in verse 13, he says, but he who endures until the end, because these things, the implication is, are not the end, then whoever endures until the end, well, they will be saved. Oh, by the way, one other thing. The good news of Jesus, the gospel, will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. Then the end will come. Now, as we look at this text, I want you to keep this in mind. Because the question that should enter into our minds as we read these two chapters that we often use for different reasons is, is he talking about the end of the world and his coming or is he talking about the end of Jerusalem, which will happen 30-something years later? What is he talking about? And if we had time to unpack the whole two chapters, you would see the clear divisions. But in this section, his primary focus seems to be on the end of the world, the end of all existence here on this planet. And then starting in verse 15, Jesus seems to shift to the end of Jerusalem and then later on in chapter 25, he shifts back to the end of the world and his second coming. Here's the problem. The problem is we often use the text intended to explain what's going to happen before the end of Jerusalem to think about, hey, those are signs before the end of the world. And what I want to do this morning in the couple minutes that remain is talk about some of those things that we like to quote. Signs that we like to look for. And that's a dangerous way to live. I'm just going to wait until I see the sign and I want to get my act together. <laughs> I'm going to wait until I see this happen because that's what it says, although it may apply to the end of Jerusalem. And then I'm going to stop doing that. And, and this is a dangerous way to live. And this is what Jesus is really addressing here Partly, one of the things I should say that he's addressing. Uh, and instead of asking and focusing on the time when Jesus will come, um, because if we focus on that, we want to focus on the destination. And let me unpack that for just one moment. Because it's not about the signs in terms of when, it's about where. And what's going to happen. See, uh, the best words to summarize Jesus' statements regarding the signs is chapter 24, verse 42. Verse 42 uh, gives us the key. Therefore, keep watch for you do not know when. So what's the key word there? The key word is it, look for the signs so that you can figure out when. Watch. 
watch. And for what purpose should we watch? Keep watch is what he wants us to focus on because the reality is Jesus will not come when we think he's going to come. Jesus is going to come when we do not expect it. And so how do we understand these signs that he's talking about here and how do we respond to them? Because the reality is if we're honest with ourselves, these signs, many of them have been happening since they were first written down. They were, they've been happening. Uh, wars, rumors of wars, persecution. There's always been earthquakes and natural disasters and famines. So how do we understand this? I want to illustrate it this way. I want to illustrate it this way. A few years ago, um, my family and I moved from Maryland to California. And uh, my wife had to go on ahead, so I took our two young children and we did the road trip. And on the way there, uh, their number one question was, are we there yet? And I would say, look at the signs. And I remember getting to a place where it said, 50 miles left. See, we read the signs and are used to reading the signs in one particular way. The signs for us tell us how much longer it's going to take to get to that destination. 50 miles to get to California, yay. So we look for the signs and we say, it's got to be about a destination. 50 miles almost there. But that's not how Jesus intended for us to read the signs. Jesus had something different in mind. Not uh, for us to look and see, hey, here's some signs in the Middle East or in Rome or in Israel. Here's something that's going on. That's not what Jesus wants us to do because that makes us think of signs in an unhealthy way. Let me turn a twist on this. Imagine if my wife had been with us on that trip and imagine that she had been with child and she went into labor pains. How would that have changed the trip? Right? How would that have changed the trip? Because the reality is, if we look at verse 8 of what Matthew 24 has to say, verse 8 reminds us that all the events must take place. And when they do, when you see these signs, they're the beginning of birth pains. They're the beginning of like a child, a woman who's in labor with a child. So what would I know if my wife was with me on that trip and she went into labor? I would know two things at least. One is that it, that trip still had some challenges left in it. There was going to be some pain. There's going to be some challenges. There's going to be some suffering still that's going to take place. And, and I would understand that. And the second thing that I would knew that Jesus knew is that, hey, it's going to be hard. And I'm not going to be there right away. And so Jesus, knowing that we would go through a difficult time, Jesus, knowing that our journey to the promised land would be difficult, said, I'm going to give you some signs. But those signs aren't there to tell you when. Those signs are there to tell you you're on the right road. You're headed in the right direction. Don't give up, even though Jesus is not come yet. Don't give up because you're on the right road. You see the signs, and the signs tells us you're tracking. You're headed in the right direction. We don't know when. That's not the purpose of the signs. The purpose of the signs is to know that we are headed in the direction that God wants us to head. It's about being on the right road. So what's the lesson for us? It's really about living an ever-ready life. It's really about not worrying about trying to figure out when. It's about living as if today is the day that you meet your maker. It's about understanding that Jesus wants us to journey with him. Sometimes the journey... As we wait for the second coming, we might wonder, has God forgotten about us? And that's just part of the reality. I wonder that, God, <laughs> look what's going on in the world, in my life, in those close to me. God, have you forgotten about me? Have, have you forgotten? And Jesus is saying, <laughs> look, when you see the signs, it's a reminder that I'm still in control. You're on the right track. You're on the right road. Yeah, the journey's going to be like a woman 
in labor pains. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be difficult. But it's a reminder that we should live ever ready lives. So this morning, afternoon, I want to remind you that you are still on the right road. You see those signs, you're wondering, you're still on the right road. The signs, when you see them, point to the kingdom ahead. It's there. It's ahead. I may not see it. I may not know when, but the sign points to the kingdom of head. So be ready every day because of the faithfulness of God, the journey will end one day and you will be home.